Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, look at all of you, shiny and happy, and God bless you. I finally made it to the Sobriety Under the Sun convention. Uh, took me a long time. I was 65 years old now. And when you're 65, the only time you don't feel like you might want to pee is when you're peeing. You know what I mean? Like a lot. So, Well, it's, I've already offended some of the group, so I might as well continue. I want to thank... Uh, Speaker Chair Cynthia and, and, and Conference Chair Dave for all of the work, all of the love, all of everything that you've done to make this thing come together. It's amazing. And uh, it's always wonderful to see signers for the hearing impaired. Frankly, most of us in this room are hearing impaired. <laughs> Well, two more offended, so anyway. <laughs> okay, can you hear me all right? Can you hear me at the back of the room? No? <laughs> so it's just exciting to be with me, you know what I mean? So... Anyway, my name is Marty. I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you. I've been sober since uh, February the 8th of 1976. And as you know, I'm a Canadian. It's, it's a strange thing about everything, you know, and labels and, and names. But Canadians have developed this uh, false reputation in the world of being so polite, you know, like... <laughs> And I'm sorry if that offends you, but <laughs> anybody that believes that has never meant a, a sober Canadian Elanon. They they do not apologize. You know what I? Mean? That's all I'm saying. Well, I got Vanoy. That's three offended. So Vanoy and I go back 40 years. First time I heard her talk. You were in for a, such a great talk. You're, you've got a great lineup here this weekend. So I'm, I'm just really glad that you're all here. Elanon, as you may or may not know, was the, the driving force behind the invention of GPS. <laughs> you get in the car and, and uh, it just says turn left, turn right, turn left, you turn right anyway. It doesn't even say anything. It just releases with love. And uh, <laughs> and recalculating. You see what I'm saying there, right? <clears throat> it doesn't matter where you go. They already know the instructions of where you got to go and what you got to do. And they're, they're just patiently waiting for you to learn. That's, that's what I know about our beloved Elanons. I love Elanon. Um, I was married to one for about 28 years, and then she stopped going to Elanon meetings, and all of a sudden we were divorced. And that's the truth. I could just see her become more perfect every day, and my flaws just expanded. So, <laughs> Five offended. So um, I, uh, I've been sober a long time, obviously, almost 42 years. 42 years next month. And I think, personally, and some of you, thank you. A yeah. little round of applause for God. Um, I, uh, I, I just think AA is better today than it was back then. And like, for example, when I sobered up, they almost encouraged your sponsor to lie to you. And when we're trying to discourage that at this point. Like, for example, my sponsor one time told me, if you ever relapse, I'll know because we're Alcoholics Anonymous. We're everywhere. We're watching you, and you don't know who we are. 
know what I'm saying? You know, Alcoholics Anonymous today talks about spiritual values, which is the very core of this program. And back in 1976, not so much. In fact, I remember being at a meeting and somebody heading into their belief in God and somebody hucked a great big baby bottle at him. He said, suck on that and then don't drink. And uh, that don't drink thing only works for a while and then you've got to start doing some other stuff about shifting where your will is operating from. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And so um, I, would, I did not come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I was... Uh, uh, homeless or anything like that. That that was not my experience. I had a job. In fact, about 80% of the people that come to Alcoholics Anonymous have jobs and wives and cars and husbands and and uh, and we're called functioning alcoholics, whatever the hell that might be. Um, and, and so what happened to me was that I have this nosy sister. She's a real bag. And... Uh, <laughs> Yes, one resentment still left to work with here, but she, <laughs> my my sister never had a drinking problem. My brother Michael's an alcoholic, recovered in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. My late brother Paul was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and she just sticks her nose in everybody's business. That's just what, you know, that's just the truth. That's just how she meddles. And so I was coming off of a bender. You know, I'd sworn to God I would never drink again as, you know, most of you might have done at some point in your drinking. I made a deal, and I said to God, if you could get me out of this mess that I'm in right now, I, I'll become a, a missionary in Africa. I know you're waiting for me. And uh, so so what happened was I went to work, and, and it would, it had been a bad night. I mean, there was, I remember there was a gun. Do you, do you come in and out of blackouts? Yeah. Like you wake up in front of the po- on uh, riding the pony in front of Walmart, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, anyway, I, I, as this night was racing through my mind, I remembered there was a gun and there was a girl, and there was a bare breast, and then uh, but it wasn't one of ours because, although I only had faint memories of what that was about, because I my drinking had really taken on. A, a dynamic as it, as it does for many people at the end of their drinking. It was just, it was just relentless. And so, uh, when I came to I, these these things are going across the screen of my mind, and I was thinking, oh my God, you know, how am I going to get out of this and and that? And and so I made this prayer, and and uh, and and then I went to work, and 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 they were taking a guy down the hallway, the radio station I worked at, in handcuffs. And apparently he had a gun out, and so I hadn't hallucinated it. It was a real gun. And uh, and I got called in the president's office, and he told me, you know, you're a very artistic, talented guy. We, we have great hopes for you. And if you ever shove a pizza in my face again, I will pound you to a lifeless pulp, you know. And uh, I, I had no memory uh, of a lot of these things, just bits and pieces. And, and so basically by the time on my shift came, I was a broadcaster back in that day, uh, by the time my shift came, Everything had settled down. Is, is that, <laughs> that just happens over and over and over again in the life of an alcoholic. You know, like seemingly non resolvable situations just evaporate. And so I thought to myself, about well, four o'clock in the afternoon, even though I made this deal with God, uh, I've had a lot of stress. You know, I mean, like, a, <laughs> I need a drink, and then I thought, well, you can't drink because you promised God you wouldn't drink. And then, of course, and this is only, you only hear this in Alcoholics Anonymous, never at an Al-Anon meeting, my keen mind set in making me an excuse, as, as would happen. And what it said basically was uh, that in Cana, that Jesus Christ, who my parents talked about all the time, uh, had turned water into wine. God wants us to drink wine. It's, what was I thinking about? And so I went over and I had, uh, I had a, a drink of wine and seven up. <laughs> it's normal, right? And uh, we used to call that porch climber, where I came from. But by the way, where I came from in, in, in Canada is the middle of Canada. And I think just about everybody in this room is from Canada. He flew 2,500 miles to hear an idiot they won't walk across the street to listen to at home. That's just <laughs> kind of how it works. 
But anyway, so I, Saskatchewan is where I was born. This is flat. If you've never been in Canada, very flat. Yeah. You stand on a beer box in Saskatchewan on a clear day, you can see the back of your own head. That's how flat it is <laughs> in Saskatchewan. And uh, so, I mean, it wasn't that I was totally ignorant about all of this God stuff, but I mean, I kind of had a few twists and turns in it. And so I went across to the bar and I had a kiafa and I had 7-Up. And after a couple of kiafa and 7-Up, what happened to me is what happened to you and happens to every alcoholic. He said, all of a sudden, I started wondering, who says I can't drink? You know, like, what was I thinking? In fact, I'm, I'm going to drink a lot. I'm, in fact, I'm going out to phone my wife, and I'm going to tell her I may not be home, ever. <laughs> it's just heartbreaking when they say good. But anyway, <laughs> so I got very drunk and I went out and uh, I was with, uh, I was a, a radio broadcaster and I was with the television weatherman. His name was Jim McCrory. He was my best friend. And we started pushing each other because there was nobody else to fight with and we were just pushing one another. And all of a sudden he threw me into a parking meter and I hit my back. And I said, you little bugger. And I grabbed him and I threw him right through a bank window. Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I don't know why cops can get there so fast when you're in the wrong, but they can. And the next thing I know, I've got a pistol in my face and uh, one of Saskatoon's finest telling me to get down on the ground. And uh, I'm saying, <laughs> you're overreacting. I... Uh, we're just drunk. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that that was the rationale for a lot of my drinking. Was I, and and it, it, no matter what the behavior was, I was just drunk. I didn't mean it. Well, if you did it, you meant it. There's, one of the difficult things I find in Alcoholics Anonymous is to get people to own what they're doing and match a result to it. It's sort of like... I did all this, and now mysteriously, my life is unraveling. <laughs> Why? You know. <laughs> the police officer takes my driver's license. He sees my name. He said, are you that guy on the radio? And I said, yeah. He said, you, you, you are the funniest person on earth. And then he gets Jim. Jim's all cut up, and he's in the bank. And he says, well, there's no reason. I'll, I'll just call the bank manager, and we'll, I know you guys weren't trying to rob the bank or anything. So they put a big piece of wood in there, so now maybe it's 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm alcoholic. I'm thinking, this is it? Like, there's got to be more than this. So we head for the car. And Jim, again, is all little piece of shards of glass in his head and everything like that. But we get in the car, and I say to him, you know, I haven't got any money. Have you got any money? He said, no. I said, well, then we're going to have to go over the top of the parkade. He said, I'm on. You know? They should never run shows like Dukes of Hazard when there's alcoholism in the world, right? Because you're just, you're pretty sure if you wind that thing up bad enough, you're going to go up and over. But you don't. You go oh, like that. Jim breaks his nose on the dashboard. The radiator falls out of the car. And Jim says, I think we should phone your wife to come and get us. And, <laughs> and it's morning. And the phone's ringing, and it's my nosy sister. <laughs> and she's got one of those pre al questions. I don't know where, where they get questions like this, because they're so insidious. They're so, it's like they're looking right through me. She said, how are you? How much does she know, right? Like, what does she know? What is, what is she saying? Like, how are you is an esoterical question, or is she saying, like, how are you, or does she know something, and I'm supposed to admit it? And then she followed it up with one that was even more mysterious. She said, do you think you might have a drinking problem? <laughs> no. No. 
Nobody could drink with me. I could drink better than anyone. I had no problem drinking whatsoever. She said, would you, if I send a, a, a man over from Alcoholics Anonymous, would you talk to him? And I thought, man, I haven't got enough trouble. Now I've got to help some guy from Alcoholics <laughs> the burden of leadership, you know. <laughs> anyway, that, uh, that brought into my life Dwayne. Dwayne. Dwayne was like six foot four, 250 pounds, he had a brush cut. I was ultra cool. I was a radio announcer. He's got a 1976 Ford LTD with plastic seats. <laughs> my my father-in-law was a Norwegian. I hated Norwegians. Not anymore. <laughs> my father, I would go to pick my 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 wife up, and he'd stand in the hallway, and he'd go, "Dee the girl, if he me you know. Okay, so our signer's Norwegian, big deal, so. <laughs> I had this guy for a sponsor for years, years and years, before I found out his real identity. They finally came out with a movie, several movies in fact, all about his life, called Shrek. And... <laughs> I've got people from my home group here tonight, and I, I promise you, this guy looks just like Shrek, doesn't he? He does, you know? And so somebody said to me one day, doesn't that offend him when you, you call him Shrek? And I, I said, I don't know. But I, I do know the last time I talked, his name tag said Shrek on it. That, that I do know. Anyway, so this guy shows up huge, and he lies, like I told you. And, and he comes in the house and he says, let's go and have a coffee. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you know that Alcoholics Anonymous does not sort of, it, it isn't clear to you when you first get here. You don't know why they're doing these maneuvers. But he wanted me to go to the A&W, sit in his car with him. I know. And <laughs> I... I, honest to God, I didn't know, I didn't, couldn't get away from him, so I got in the car and we went to the A&W, and he had read that chapter in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous called The Family Afterward. And he had read the chapter in the book Alcoholics Anonymous called Working with Others, in which it said, if your man is not very serious about anything, tell him some funny stories out of your past. So he started to talk about these things that he had done, horrible things. And I don't know if you're an alcoholic of my variety, I can out horrible you on any good Friday. You see what I'm saying here? I really believe if you went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and said you made love to a zebra, somebody would say, well, at least the one you got was a female. You know? <laughs> so he starts telling these horrendous stories. He's broken a train in half to get to a liquor store, and he's done this. And he went out to, to, uh, to get milk and didn't come home for nine months. And I, you know, I'm doing my best to top him. And finally he says, geez, it sounds like you've got a lot of trouble when you drink. I thought, oh, man. <laughs> I went right alcoholic. I am going to kill my sister because she sick this goon on me. Now he knows all my secrets. He knows where I live. And he's Norwegian, so, he, you know, he's never going to figure his way out of this. And, then, and he's gone to the Alcoholics Anonymous closing school, you know. So he says, well, it sounds to me like you get in a lot of trouble when you drink and you don't get in any trouble when you don't drink. <laughs> Why don't you just not drink? He said, good idea. 
I'll just do that. He says, no, you won't. So here, here's a... Uh, by the way, in 1976, step one was shut up, get in the car. That's, there wasn't a lot beyond that. So I, I, I said, you know, I really appreciate your time. He said, just hang on. I'm going to pick you up for a meeting in the morning. I said, what kind of a meeting? And he said, a, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, he said, I can't tell you you're an alcoholic. It says that in the book. But I really would suggest you come to this meeting. I'll pick you up at 10 o'clock. So I left the house at 9 o'clock. <laughs> and he was outside waiting for me in, in the car. <laughs> right? And he explained to me when I got in the car that here and there, newcomers will try and get away on you, that you have to kind of go a little early sometimes. Right? And we went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was in the back of a restaurant. And I was saying to people who were just having breakfast, I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> I'm with an alcoholic. <laughs> but I don't have it. And so, and he's saying, you are embarrassing me. Shut up already. I'm, going, You're, I'm embarrassing you. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so... I don't know. At the airport, this, when I got here, I just got here today, and that airport looked very much like my first AA meeting. Average age in that airport, dead. These were old people at that meeting. Old. 40, 50-year-old people. I mean, I'm 23. I could, and I couldn't believe it. They were all talking at the same time with uh, unrelated subjects going up and down some damn stairs or steps. I didn't know what they were talking about. One of them had been uh, stuck on the fifth step. Way too long, apparently. And another one said, if you don't get off that fifth stair, you're going to get drunk. So I'm thinking, where is the fifth stair? Because if I could have a couple of drinks and just stop shaking and calm down, I know I'd love this place like you love this place, you know? <laughs> so the meeting goes on and on. And the, I had never seen anybody in my life drink coffee like this group of people were currently drinking coffee. I was looking under the table for colostomies or something. How, how could anybody <laughs> drink 900 cups of coffee in one hour? <laughs> and they smoked in those days. <laughs> Some of you, they've been wrong. You knew it was a really good meeting if you could only see feet at the end of it. <laughs> we, they didn't have to call it Alcoholics Anonymous. By the end of me the meeting, it was anonymous. Believe me, you didn't know it. <laughs> what the hell? I have no idea what they're talking about. But Shrek is loving it. He's just, you know? And... <laughs> <laughs> so the meeting ends and this really old one looked like he'd been sent out to be wrinkled <laughs> Vince he gets up and he says if you want what we have <laughs> I really don't want what you have <laughs> he said I had to be ready to go to any lengths to get it and if I didn't, I'd either end up in an insane asylum or dead. So I thought about that, and I said, well, I'll, I said to Shrek, I'll take dead, because I don't, <laughs> I can't do this. You see what I'm saying? But when you're new, you're slick and quick, and when we got in the parking lot, he said, how did you like the meeting? He said, I loved it. I said, you guys have really got something going there. If you want to come on my show and raise some money or whatever, he said, oh, shut up. I said, I said excuse me, radio personality, loser. <laughs> he said, you're an alcoholic. I said, whoa, whoa. You told me last night you couldn't tell me I was an alcoholic. He said that was last night. 
Normal people go, don't go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, for heaven's sake. I said, well, I don't want to go to any more meetings. He said, I don't care. He said, if you drink, he said, I'm going to make you this offer right now. Call me first. I'll buy you your first drink, and then I'm going to bust every bone in your body. He was big. It wasn't funny, really. <laughs> and I said, why do you talk to me like this? And he said, because I love you. Uh, get in the car. Shrek taught me everything that I needed to know about people who are not particularly interested in what I think. Because I would get in the car and I would say, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he'd say, you know, <laughs> don't care. And I said, you know, I really don't like you. And he said to me one day, that is so weird because I really like you. And he'd come to my house all the time. It was weird, you know. You'd open the back door at 8 o'clock in the morning and Shrek would stand there with a coffee cup. I thought you were going to sleep all day. Like, get a life. At his 40th anniversary, they asked me to come and share, and I went on and on and on about the sacrifices he'd made for me and the time he spent with me, and he got up and he said, what a bunch of crap. He said, I didn't care about him. I was fighting with my wife. I just couldn't go home. That's, I didn't care about him. So Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship. You know, that, that, that night he came and picked me up for another meeting. We went to endless meetings in the beginning, and, and this meeting was called Mustard Seeds, and there was a man at that meeting named Joe Glum. I was later to find that Joe Glum had multi-millions of dollars. And Joe Glum was so humble and like kind of one of those guys you see at the group that you don't see at the group, but they're always there. And, and I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm flat broke. I mean, I've spent everything I had. I am bankrupt spiritually, mentally, physically. And I feel something weird under the table, and I, I kind of move back, and it's Joe Glum under the table putting shoelaces in my runners because he saw me at the morning meeting, apparently, and felt bad that I didn't have any shoelaces. So he went and bought some and <laughs> laced my shoes. And that's not how I felt. I wanted to kick Joe Glum right square in the teeth. Acts of kindness are like aggression when you're an alcoholic. You know, like, why are you being, what do you want? That's what I kept thinking. I'm like, what do they want? And so we got outside and I said to Shrek, I am not going to any more meetings. He said, of course you are. You're hysterical. I said, I'm not trying to be hysterical. He said, that's what's so hysterical. And he said, I'll make you a deal. You go to 90 meetings in 90 days. You see, there is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's in a book called The Big Book. And in that big book, the first 88 pages up to page 60, because there's the Roman numerals, it talks about being convinced that A, that we're alcoholic, can't manage our own lives, B, that probably no human power could relieve our alcoholism and see that God could and would. And that's what that's about. And then it stops. And this is where I had to get off the Shrek train and I had to catch another unit. And I have the, people ask me all the time in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, like my sponsor and I aren't doing this. We've become friends. We're not doing this. I tell them, get, get somebody else. This is your life. You've got to get somebody that you trust. You've got to get somebody with half a clue as to the fact that you are an individualized block of consciousness, an expression of a power greater than yourself. We're all on this huge circuit. We're all connected. If you've got somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous that doesn't understand that principle, they're going to have a hell of a time getting you through step three. And you see, what happened to me was I, I loved that Shrek got me that far. And then I started to reach out to try and connect to something spiritually. In fact, I went once to the church. I really, man, I went after the church. If you're an alcoholic, you do everything alcoholically, right? So I went into the church. 
I became so obnoxious in the church that they asked me to leave. But the, the pastor said to me one time, he said, you know, like when you're in a congregation and I'm up there preaching, who's the audience? And I thought, what a moron. We're the audience. You're preaching. We're the audience. He said, no, God is the audience. He said, I don't think you get this. You need to go back to your own people. He said, we've got rows and rows and rows of nice people. Your people need you. You need to go back to them. I didn't tell him I'd got kicked out of Alcoholics Anonymous the night before because <laughs> I told Shrek I didn't want to listen to his dirty jokes. I'd got so spiritually minded I was of no earthly good, you know. And so Shrek said, you know, it's time. He said, I'm phoning New York. I'm having your name taken off the speaker's list. <laughs> Get out of the car. Walk home. You're out. It's done. Get out. So, uh-oh. <laughs> Now I got to go back to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm I, I've got pride. You see, you know, there's so many misunderstandings in Alcoholics Anonymous about what happened. But Bill Wilson had been in treatment four times. He was what some seniors call a retread. He was a guy that wasn't he couldn't get it until he got it. You hear when you hear Chuck used to say. And you'll see when you see, and not a minute before. And so, in Alcoholics Anonymous, what happened for me was I started to look at that first 88 pages, and I, I was completely convinced that I was alcoholic. I knew that because once I started to drink, most often I could not st stop. I mean, I could not even control the amount that I drank. I mean, I took a drink, and then the drink took a drink. And, and time after time... I went out, and this will sound weird to, to, to our visitors, but I went out to not get drunk, purposely to not get drunk, just to get absolutely hammered. And, and we've got this thing in Alcoholics Anonymous in 2018 with people talking about addiction versus program, you know, program versus addiction. You know, right in the doctor's opinion, it's clear. Silkworth says we have alcoholism addiction. Alcoholism, addiction. It's subtle, but it's real. The physical aspect of it, the alcoholism, the insidious spiritual melody that drives us crazy, ends up as an addiction. A thought that overcomes all other thoughts. An obsession that will not let you alone. And so what happens in, in Alcoholics Anonymous is they broke that step into the two pieces. They said, powerless over alcohol and many things. And then there's a dash if you get really close to that dash with the magnifying glass, it's a little paragraph, and it says, the problem centers in the alcoholic's mind. And then it says, our lives have become unmanageable. That's addiction. That's the thing that calls you back sober. And so for almost 28 years in Alcoholics Anonymous, I lived a mechanical kind of an AA life. Step three to me was a sort of a, a tip to the idea that there may or may not be a God, that I may or may not serve him. But for today, I've got these compartments in my life. I've got business. I've got AA. I've got this. I've got all compartmentalized. And what happened to me at 28 years sober is, is that I had to walk away from Alcoholics Anonymous. I couldn't hear the music anymore. I couldn't hear your stories. I couldn't see any truth in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous because I'd closed myself off. You know, this whole notion around having a soul, this whole idea about being this, this individualized block of consciousness, this soul that we all are. It's me that turns the light on to that or turns it off. It's nothing else. If you're not hearing from God, you, you turn the switch off. Trust me. The thing just runs all the time. It's like an electrical circuit. Light bulb's on, light bulb's off. Somebody's got to turn it on. And with me, it has to start with me. And so when I got up to that step three, you know, I looked at that idea about, you know, that there's a power greater than myself. And I thought, that's just ridiculous. Of course there is. Alcohol is more powerful than myself. That's why I drank it. I was an alcoholic at 11 years old. I remember I had a sober uncle, Uncle Stan. He was in Alcoholics Anonymous since 1942. And no matter what was happening, he looked constipated.
And then I had Uncle Sam, and he was a drunk. And he'd get one eye closed, and he'd, he'd talk about being in the Navy and all the things he did in the Navy. The only problem was Uncle Sam was, he was in the Army. <laughs> he was a decorated Canadian war hero in the Second World War, but when he was drunk, he was in the Navy. <laughs> he just thought Navy guys were cooler or something. I don't know what it was, but he gets one eye closed. And he said, I was 143 pounds soaking wet. Ask your mother. My mother didn't even know him when he was in the Army. And I thought, boy, if I ever drink and get that one eye closed, I'm done. My wife said to me one night, I'm okay until that eye of yours closes. And then I just, I can't, I can't stand it. So I thought to myself, fine. If I ever get both eyes closed, I'm done. So when you're doing that type of a program in Alcoholics Anonymous and you're in a room like this tonight and you're 12 years sober or you're 18 years sober or you're 7 years sober and you got that dirty little secret, not working for me anymore, you know, and, and you're thinking to yourself, well, I've done it all. I know exactly what I've done. I know everything that there is to know about Alcoholics Anonymous. You may. You may mechanically be the most brilliant person in this room. But the problem with the big book is the stuff that's written in the big book that matters is all spiritual. You can't see it through physical eyes. And so what I did in Alcoholics Anonymous at 28 years sober was I walked away from Alcoholics Anonymous. I was a guy that used to talk all over the place, and I stopped. And I didn't talk for six years. I didn't drink. But I can honestly tell you it was like being in a forest with a compass that didn't have any numbers on it. I couldn't tell right from wrong, up from down, I, everything that I destroyed in my life, I destroyed in those two years I didn't go to meetings in, in when I lived in D.C., Washington, D.C. And what, how could that possibly happen to somebody? And the answer is, is that when you start to think that you know all that there is to know, that's when you need to find somebody to help you. Because you can't possibly know all that there is to know. So when I went back to the book and I opened it up and the AA fairy had been in my big book, you know, this, this thing that happens, you know, there's a guy, there's a, a, a psychiatrist named Tebow who talked about hitting bottoms, bottoms. This is when you, you finally realize I cannot of myself fix this. That's when you hit a bottom. It can happen when you're drinking. It can happen when you're sober. And our bottoms are also transparent. You can see through the bottom you're at to the bottom below and the bottom below and the bottom below. And somehow you think to yourself, that'll never happen to me. And every week, you know, they read the death scrolls of the ones that were thinking the same way you were. We've all seen way too much attrition in Alcoholics Anonymous because we're so busy standing in the room saying, when's somebody going to do something for me? And Alcoholics Anonymous says that as long as you're saying that, nothing's ever going to happen for you. But the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous is inverting that selfish, self-centered drive to say, who in this room needs me to talk to them right now? How do I come out of my selfish, self-centered, fear-driven self toward this whole nonsense around love? How do I just do that? And the answer is repetition. You just do it and you do it, and you do it until your mind finally says, oh, this is what I do. Wednesday night I go to the Lions Group. The Lions Group, there's an assorted group of lunatics. Our, our meeting will unravel at a different speed every week. The same crazy people will be crazy. There'll be newcomers mysteriously attracted to something they don't understand and definitely don't want. Go talk with one of them. We actually had to create a position in our group to make it official so that people do get talked to after meetings because it's so easy just to get into that clutch. You know, you know, you and your friends, you all have B.O. in one corner, the stinkers all in one corner talking with the other stinkers. <laughs> Somebody has to go talk to that new guy and gal. So we formed a position in our group called a chaser. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and... 
And at every business meeting, we appoint two chasers. And their job is to not visit with anybody after the meeting, but to get those alcoholic radar eyeballs to say, who in the room is not connecting with anybody? And then go say, hey, this is the sickest group in Vancouver. I think you fit. You know what I mean? You, you have no idea how much that means when you're somebody that's wallpaper. That's somebody that doesn't have a story or any sort of a history or any sort of a connection. Or you're one of the middle members that's not hearing the music anymore and you feel like you're transparent. Nobody can see me anymore. They can't see you if you're not helping them. John Lennon said, the love you get is equal to the love you give. And that's absolutely the way it is in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I came back into this crash like, oh, by the way, I have a 42-year-old son named Donovan. He was six months old when I sobered up, and he has now six months sobriety longer than me. He has never had a drink of alcohol in his entire life. Yeah, but let me tell you why. Because we used to have all the drunks out to our home at Christmas and Thanksgiving, and they'd tell them their stories. <laughs> and at nine, he came to me and he said, how do I join AA? <laughs> I said, you don't have to join AA, honey. If you don't want to drink, just don't drink. He said, you can do that? I said, yes. <laughs> I have a middle son named Chad who's a marketing executive, brilliant, brilliant mind, funniest guy in the whole world, born one year to the day that I sobered up. And then I have Bees LeBon, I mean, my daughter, Lee, she, you know, on her 16th birthday, I came home and she was laying on the floor with a 26 of whiskey, a, a vodka, a emptied pack of smokes, out cold, little pool of vomit. Hey, baby. Uh-oh. I thought we were going to get through this, but I guess we're not. And so in the morning, uh, I packed her and her 1,600-pound Tricaner Arabian Cross horse up and sent her to a private girls' school. She was so grateful. I remember at Christmas, she came home with her brush cut. She gained 50 pounds, and she came down the escalator at the airport like this. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. When she got back home... And this is the thing about love. Like, you can't stop at any quarter. It doesn't matter what they're saying to you right now. It doesn't matter if the people you're sponsoring love you and talk behind your back about how wonderful you are. Never mind any of that crap. You just keep taking that love to them, taking that love. Like Shrek, he said, I don't care what you think of me. You're an idiot. Why would I care what you think of me? That's Norwegian foreplay, in case you don't know, baby. That's how they are. So, this time I run up to it and I look at the decision and it says, I made a decision to turn my life and my will over to the care of God. And I thought, well, yeah, I've done that. Yeah. No, I hadn't done that. Because it asks a very interesting question. This is for all the go-getter course attenders. And I was teaching courses by this point, by the way. Every motivational teacher you've ever heard of, I worked with, I think. I was talking to crowds of 14,000 people. I couldn't get enough of me. <laughs> but the reality of it was dead, 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 dead. Nothing. No eyes, just physical eyes. The big book had turned into a big, dusty, old, voluminous, stinky old book. And so... I come back to it, and it says in there, it's not about making a decision, you moron. What it says is, do you now accept that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success? <laughs> what? Self-will is how I live. I was brought up that if you don't do it, it ain't going to get done. i got to push up, push up, push up, push up. I used to treat people terribly in business and then go to AA at night and say, let go and let God. I never let go of anything in business. I didn't think God could run a business. Look what he did with his own. See what I'm saying? I figured if, if God's a franchise, he has no knowledge of what he's doing. Believe me, what a mess. 
I don't want him messing in my business. I don't want to think people to think of me as a religious fanatic. And so I distanced myself from all of that, and I got to work putting all the material world blocks together, form, time, form, time, build, 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 build. And I built myself quite a little empire, millions of dollars. I had a ranch. I had thoroughbred racehorses. I had these three kids. And then it just came to a place where God said, you know, time's up. You're so smart. Try it on your own. And I left Alcoholics Anonymous. And what happened was complete destruction of everything. I lost a marriage of 31 years. I lost connection with my kids. I lost millions of dollars. The good part was I got a girl pregnant. <laughs> Sir, you look like that's not a good thing back there. That... You have not lived until you have phoned your 34-year-old daughter to tell you, tell her, you know that little brother you wanted? <laughs> oh. So, complete, God just took me back to zero. Zero. Nothing, less than nothing. This little pregnant wife, and I said, I, I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll go. I went to a book study out of absolute desperation. There's a man in the room that was at that meeting. Wayne, where are you? Are you here? Yeah, stand up. This guy, this guy was at this meeting that I went to. And there was a little forum and it said, uh, here's 30 questions about your sobriety. Did you pray today? No. Have you helped anybody today? No. Do you? And, and 30 no's. And this little English guy beside me said, how long are you sober? I said, 30 years. He said, well, you are the sickest son of a bitch I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> That's sort of like God saying, welcome back, stupid, you know? Just wanted to finish up on my daughter. You know, the interesting thing about that alcohol and the school and all that stuff that went on, it was one day, I don't know why, she said to me, Dad, take me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, if you've got kids and you're worried about your kids, the scariest thing in the world that they can say to you is take me to a meeting. Because you figure if you smile, you're going to screw it up. If you don't look excited, you're going to screw it up. It just, I didn't know what to do. So I said, okay, and walked out of the room. And, and I took her to a meeting in a place called Sylvan Lake, Alberta. There's one car in Sylvan Lake, Alberta. Everything else is a pickup truck. <laughs> Average age, 50, all males. And I take her to this meeting, and I'm thinking, I don't know, what could she possibly hear here, but it's the only meeting tonight. She's 18, 19 years old. I walk down the stairs of this old boys club, and there are kids, 20-year-olds, 19-year-olds. There must have been 20 of them at this meeting of these old geezers. And I was like, wow. So I sit my little daughter down, and they say, would you like to say something, dear? And he goes, well, like, I don't know, I, um, <laughs> like, uh, sort of, you know, like, like, um, I can't really say that. So I think that's all I got. And I look at her, and she goes, Wow. <laughs> What do you think they meant in that book, Language of the Heart? <laughs> I don't speak adolescent anymore. I don't did, understand anything those kids were talking about. She got it. She has stopped drinking. She doesn't drink. She doesn't go to Alcoholics Anonymous. She doesn't drink. So I got a 42-year-old, 40-year-old, a 38-year-old, and an 11-year-old. <laughs> I know. That's a really good. So I have them out in, the, out in a, a, a little push cart one day when he was a baby and a woman says oh my god what's your grandson's name and I said Declan she said hello Declan I said no his name is Luca she said you just told me his name was Declan I said no my grandson's name is Declan that's my son Luca and she went oh 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 <laughs> And so, you know, here I am, a grandfather and a father, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, 
watching this little lunatic grow up. And I said to my wife the other day, get him a beer. Let's get him to a meeting and get this in process because he's <laughs> completely selfish and self-centered and narcissistic. And he, you know, he has it all. You see, I think what we don't, at least what I didn't understand in Alcoholics Anonymous is that alcoholism will kill you drinking or not drinking. It's a progressive disease, drinking or not drinking. It is alcoholism addiction. So I come into Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm sober 15 minutes. I go to Shrek and I say, I need to know what's really wrong with me. He said, what, what do you mean? You're a drunk. I said, no, no, no. I know Medically, what's wrong with me? Oh, God. I said, I don't want to listen. You guys are all just a bunch of, you know, amateurs. I want to talk to somebody who's got a degree or something. So he sent me to this guy named Bob Crookshank. And I go to Bob's office and Bob says, how can I help you? And I said, I've been with this Norwegian and uh, <laughs> I want to know what's really wrong with me. He said, you have a biochemical genetic disorder centered in the hypothalamic information control center of your brain made worse by your liver's inability to metabolize alcohol without producing acid aldehyde, which mixed with dopamine produces tetrahydroisoquinoline. And that is a nasty combination given your narcissistic, egocentric core, which is driven at times by omnipotence, which tend to their own integrity, despite the cognitive dissonance and the stimulus augmentation. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> he said, your drinker is broken, and you're an ass when you're sober. Go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> so, imagine my surprise when I walk into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and there sits Bob C. <laughs> it's all rigged. All of that's true. What you have has been recognized by the American Medical Association as a disease. It is most definitely a disease of the soul. It is a disconnection with where the actual power is. No. I can't say it better than Bill when he said, he said it like this. He said, having become alcoholic, crushed by a self-imposed crisis that we were in, unable to avoid or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or he is nothing. God is or he isn't. What is your choice going to be? He said, arrived at this point, we're squarely confronted with the question of faith. We couldn't duck the issue. And many of us had come far across the bridge of reason toward the desired shore of faith. The outlines and the promises gave luster to tired eyes and new courage to flagging spirits. Friendly hands were outstretched and welcome. We were even grateful that reason had brought us so far, but somehow we just could not step ashore. And then Bill says, perhaps we had leaned on reason too much that last mile and we were afraid to lose our support. 28 years of Marty not being able to get off the bridge. I brought lots of people onto the bridge, and I would show them the promised land, and I would say, you know, this is where it's at, man. This is joy. This is life. This is truth. This is love. This is intelligence. This is soul. This is spirit. This is principle. These are the aspects of the higher power. Now let's go back to the other end of the bridge because I would not step off because I worshipped my own reasoning. And so what God had to do to me, and what I'm trying to say to you now is don't do this. You don't have to be crushed by a self-imposed crisis. What do you think that has something to do with drinking? Live with me for a week. You'll find out what a self-imposed crisis is. He gets up every morning and says, where is my cereal? You know what I mean? This, this little human ego with hair and eyeballs has been he's been testing for the last month 
to be the, the actor who is the son of David Duchovny in the X-Files. So he's a little actor, and he's obnoxious on every possible level. And he's just like a newcomer. <laughs> you know, look at me, look at me, look at me, don't look at me, don't look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, don't look at me, don't look at me. <laughs> Why aren't you looking at me? Yo, you're looking at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Why did I wear this shirt? Oh, God, what did you just say? I don't care. Oh. <laughs> Crushed. Look at your life. See your results. Understand that you're crushed frequently by a self-imposed crisis. The way out of that is the only way possible out of that. The same thing that we did when we came to Alcoholics Anonymous. We said, I don't know how to fix this. I'm willing to do whatever I have to do. And so your life becomes less about creating how you think it should look and then trying to get everybody to do that, and it becomes a lot more about unfolding. I was talking to Mari a minute ago. Mari, I don't know how many times a month Mari speaks. She's Every time I look at a, a ticket anywhere, Iceland, Mari, you know, Venus, Mari, she speaks all the time. And, and you know, I don't, she's way over 50. And uh, <laughs> I said, I, how, how, are you, how are you doing that? And she said, I don't know, I just, just keep watching it unfold. And I knew she knew. And you've seen them in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You've seen the ones with the, the thing in the eyes and everything like that. And you just, you know, you, when you knew, you pray that God will strike them drunk. Because they, they seem just like so happy. So you're interested in me, right? Piss off. How's that? Yeah? Language of the heart, you know? Love ya, if you were dead. And... <laughs> But when I am not looking for you to approve what I'm doing, if I'm not looking at you to say, oh, oh, you know, you really understand. If I'm just looking for whatever message God's going to come through me to give to you and I watch you unfold, I can tell you that the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous will come alive again. And you'll hear the music and you'll see the people. And I love going to my little group. I love going to participation group in my area, the Centennial group at White Rock. I go all over the place. I love the people of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm so happy we all gathered here tonight. And I'm, tomorrow I'm going to talk a lot about uh, the history of Alcoholics Anonymous through the eyes of people like Hank. Tomorrow, tomorrow is the day that Hank died in 1954. Coincidence? I don't think so. I hope you'll join me and thank you very, very much for letting me open this tonight. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.